Today we're going to go back to our message entitled, Continuing in God Despite the Challenges. Praise the Lord. And the first uh, verse we'll be going to is James, the fifth chapter, and verse uh, 14. And uh, there, uh, uh, James, the Apostle James, makes it very clear that believers can become afflicted with disease and sickness, uh, even in the dispens this dispensation of grace and truth. And... Um, we want to see uh, how do we deal with uh, the fact that we can become sick, we can uh, have a disease, and uh, there's a remedy that's given here by James uh, in, again, James, the fifth chapter, verse 14. He's actually going to identify 13 things that we need to do if we ever become attacked by the enemy in our physical bodies as believers. The first verse uh, of James 5 and 14 says the following. This is the first point. Uh, uh, is any sick among you? So he's asking a question of the uh, saints, those who, those who are believers, uh, who can be, become sick or they can be attacked by the enemy. And we're living in a fallen world, and uh, by virtue of that, uh, it's the possibility we can be attacked, as Job was, and we'll get back to him at the point in time. He says, let him call for the elders of the church. So the second thing you need to do is call for the elders of the church. And the third thing, let them pray over him or her, Praise the Lord, anointing him or her with oil in the name of the Lord. So there's the fourth step and the fifth step, that uh, if you don't have any oil, you need to get some. Pray over it, consecrate it, and uh, it has a point of contact. The oil doesn't heal you, but it is an act of obedience. Paul uh, James told us that we need to have the oil. We should have it consecrated for, for praying for people, and that should be available to smear on believers. Now you can pray without having oil. So sometimes you have to pray when you're not in the church and when you're in a place that uh, no oil is available. The Lord still hears those prayers. Uh, the 15th uh, verse, James 5 and 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. Notice that there. And if they commit, have committed sin, so it is possible uh, for believers to uh, uh, to be sick without having committed any sins. And that's where people go wrong. Oh, you must have committed a sin. Not necessarily. You can become sick without committing a sin, as Job uh, was attacked by the enemy. It doesn't mean he hadn't uh, said anything to charge God foolishly with his mouth. Uh, he maintained his uh, composure and his dignity because his wife would not have attacked him, which we'll read shortly. So you don't have to have uh, committed sin in order for disease or sickness to come upon you if you're a believer. But there is a remedy. That's the point we need to remember, that there is a remedy for any attack or any assault that comes against us as ch children of God. Uh, again, the 15th verse, the latter part of it, uh, it says, they shall be forgiven them. So if you have committed any sins, the Lord will forgive those sins that you confess and acknowledge. Uh, the Lord then will uh, cleanse the slate and forgive you of the sins, should you have... Uh, uh, run into some kind of disease as a result of sin, venereal disease or things of that nature. You know, the consequences of the laws of sowing and reaping, even though you're a child of God, you indulge yourself in behavior that is not of God, and as a result, um, you're afflicted with a disease. So it's just a matter of coming back and asking the Lord to forgive you, to cleanse you, and to restore you. Uh, the uh, 16th verse, uh, James 5 and 16, confess your faults one to another. That's something that we as believers should do. You don't confess your faults to people who are not saved, but if they're saved, and especially if they're part of the local church, and they're individuals who are not going to pass it and spread it amongst everybody that's in the church, so you need to be discriminating uh, and discerning before you decide to share certain things that are confidential, uh, embarrassing with people, even though they are part of the church. There's a lot of people that say they are Christians who are not really Christians. Some that are even in the church who are not living uh, like they should. So we need to be, use discretion when we share certain things that are secretive, things that you don't want to get out for the whole world to know. You don't want it uh, put on YouTube. You don't want it uh, broadcast across the, the telephones. Uh, so you keep it to yourself if there's no one around who is developed in the things of God that can handle it. And if it's something that is really critical, uh, just keep it to yourself. We don't have to share everything that's an issue that we have in our lives. Again, 5 and 16, James 5 and 16, and pray one for another. That's something we need all need to do as members of the body of Christ. That you may be healed. Notice it, that you may be healed. And they say you will be healed, may be healed. So there are certain conditions that need to be met in order to receive healing. One of it is calling for the people to pray for you, the elders of the church, being anointed with oil, and being open to share 
any sins you're going to have to the proper people. Praise the Lord. And the final verse here, uh, the final point of that 16th verse, uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That uh, the effectual, effectual fervent prayers of a righteous person generates much power. So that's why we want to make sure the people that are praying for us are righteous people, men, men or women, men or women. Uh, let them pray for you that you may can be alleviated and the disease can be removed. I want you to observe that uh, James identified those 13 things there. If you go through again, I sort of identified 13 particular things that uh, were captured uh, in sharing what believers should do if they're ever smitten or stricken with a disease. I want you to notice that the verses declared by the Apostle James did not say believers are immune to sickness. I opened with that. Instead, he focused on the remedy the Lord has provided uh, for us today. And uh, so although I did not address it uh, at the, in detail, it is possible for believers uh, to sin. It is possible to commit sin. The Lord doesn't stop you, but it should get better and better as you live and uh, as a, a child of God. It should be easier and easier not to sin, to breach the covenants and the laws that are in the Word of God. God's remedy for one who has sinned is for him, uh, the person, uh, to confess their sin before the Lord and endeavor to live a holy life, praise God. And then the Lord, of course, will expunge the sin that is remaining in their lives and allow them to move forward free from sin from that moment forward. Uh, both the Apostle John and the Apostle Paul, uh, respectively, addresses this in the following verses. Uh, first John, the first chapter, and the ninth verse, it says, if we uh, confess, and he's talking to believers here, if you look at the first verse of uh, uh, 1 John 1, make sure that uh, you understand that the people he is primarily talking to here are people who already confess Jesus as Lord. These are believers that he's talking to. It says, if we sin, if we confess, meaning to acknowledge by verbally confessing them, in other words, you got to say it out loud, loud. You got to identify that uh, you have committed the sin when you pray before the Lord. He is faithful, so we're praying before the Lord, we're talking to Him. Uh, he is faithful and just, 1 John 1 and 9, to forgive us our sins, He's talking to believers again, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, unrighteousness comes when you're doing things that are not right before God, things that are not pleasing to Him. Then you have to clean the slate so that we're not condemned. The Lord forgive you. Uh, but the point is, can you forgive yourself? It's hard to have faith when you know you haven't done right. Praise the Lord. Galatians 4.19, uh, again, we see uh, John had made a statement to us about sin, uh, having sin in our lives and how to remedy it and get rid of it. And here in Galatians 4.19, he talks about that, the possibility. My little children, of whom I travail in birth pains. Again, birth, again. It's the same kind of pains that women go through when they're birthing their babies. It's significant pain, and uh, when we commit sin, it, it's a similar type of feeling that the Lord has, that here's my beloved, here's my son, one who confessed me as Lord, and uh, they're indulged in sins, so now they need to be birthed again in the things of God. So Paul was saying that he is the person who is doing the labor. He is the midwife uh, because these were his children of God. He found out that they had been practicing sin, and so he's saying he's going to travail, he's going to go through the suffering and the pain that's associated with birthing someone into the kingdom of God. And this will be his second, third time that he has to do that, or maybe even the fourth time. Until, he said, he's going to keep on birthing them uh, if he finds out about them with, until he has opportunity, as many times as he has opportunity to restore people and get them back to where they're supposed to be. He's going to do it until Christ be formed in you. He's saying, I'm just going to keep on praying for you confessing the things I know that you're indulging in that are not of God until finally, hopefully, uh, Christ will be fully formed in your heart. Praise the Lord. So the Apostle Paul reminds us that God will not permit us to endure any tests that we as believers uh, are not capable of handling. And a lot of people wonder about that. The Lord is watching you. First Corinthians, the 10th chapter and the 13th verse, I'm going to read from the New King James Version. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to being man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That word temptation is used there. I think we may have 
said this earlier, but it bears repeating. Uh, the word temptation is the Greek word parasmos, and what it means is a putting to proof of uh, putting to proof, which means by experimentation of good. So we experiment with the things of God. We utilize the Word of God that we are aware of, and uh, when we go into our challenges, we confess that Word. Uh, in faith, believing that there will be a manifestation of those things that we're asking for. So uh, temptation gives us a chance to put to proof the, the word of God so we can have a mighty testimony you can share with others. And it also means experience of evil. And so that uh, I think it will be empathetic to other individuals and not so quick to, to pounce on them when they begin to indulge in sin because uh, the Bible said that we need to those who are spiritual, restore such a one. If you find your brother uh, that's involved in a fall or a sin, he said those who are spiritual, not just anybody, those who are spiritual, restore such a one. In a spirit of meekness, consider yourself lest you also fall. So you need to have the right attitude when you're trying to restore a person who's uh, been caught in, up in sin, especially if they're a believer. Uh, instead of ridiculing them and beating them down, you're supposed to be building them up. And that's why I said those who are spiritual, restore such a one. If you're not a spiritual person, you confess Jesus the Lord, but you're not spiritual. Then you don't need to be going around correcting anybody. If you have no empathy for them, you don't. You shouldn't uh, say anything to them. You know, you know let you also be tempt tempted. So uh, make sure that you're at a point where you're trying to build people up, not to tear them down. Uh, praise the Lord. So it's two aspects of temptation. One is experience, uh, experimentation of good. You know, the Word of God, utilizing it. Uh, in opposition to that which is attacking you. And the other one is uh, the encounter you're having with the enemy. Opposition is negative and it's bad. And when other people go through it, there's the empathy, I believe, that's important to you to understand the feelings because you went through it yourself. Praise the Lord. The Lord Jesus also revealed that sin and sickness uh, both originated from Satan. That's another point we need to realize. It's hard to pray for something to be removed from our physical bodies when we think it's something that's been given to us by God. That's why I continually say, when I look at the tests that Job was going through, and we're going to look at some more momentarily, uh, that the testing that came against him was the enemy who had brought it. And the Lord permitted it, but the enemy is the one who actually caused the problems and uh, killed his children and blew his home down and killed his uh, servants and took his cattle. And so all those bad things he encountered, and ultimately the Lord allowed him to even afflict the body of Job. But all of it came from Satan, did not come from God. So make sure you remember that. So Lord Jesus also revealed that sin and sickness both originated from Satan and therefore may be removed by the blood shed by Jesus Christ in his redemptive work on Calvary's cross. Uh, for he promised us before his ascension on high, saying the following in St. John 14 and 12. And this is for we who are believers today. Uh, again, uh, this is actually the, the, the words of the Lord Jesus. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, notice you got to believe on the Lord, uh, the works that I do shall he do also. So it, this scripture here, the Lord is saying to we who are followers of him, we who are his disciples, that uh, the same works that he did, we're going to do also. Uh, the works that I do shall ye do also, and greater works. And this is a part of people stumble. Um, Greater works than these shalt thou do, because I go into the Father. So we are his ambassadors. We are his representatives here in the earth realm. Uh, Paul reiterates that uh, in the book of uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, that's what our job around the uh, 17, 18 verses. He, he makes it clear that we are ambassadors of Christ. We're his representatives because Christ is seated at the right hand of the majesty, right hand of Father God in heaven, where he ever lives to make intercession for us. So he's there to assist us. But we are his representatives here in the earth. We are, are his ambassadors here in the earth realm uh, for uh, the works of God to be performed. And so, but he made it clear that the great works that he did, the mighty works, when he was here during his earthly sojourn, we are responsible for doing the same thing. Also, there's some things that we're going to be involved in that he can't do. Now, some people say, well, what could that possibly be? You know, of course, if Christ had remained here in the earth realm beyond the 33 years, uh, then yes, any and everything that's possible, that's supernatural, that could be done, he could have done it. But uh, just because it says he did not do it, because it, the greater works than these shall I do, there are some greater works that he uh, could have done if he lived long enough to do it because he was filled with the Spirit without measure. So there was nothing he couldn't do by the Holy Spirit. 
But the point is that he made it clear there's some things that we're going to get involved in uh, in this day uh, that are mirac of a miraculous nature that we as believers who believe will do uh, and to, to bring glory to God. Praise the Lord. And so people try to figure it out. I said, well, if I get on the TV and, and I air my program to a million people, Christ would only reach a, a, a few hundred people. I could reach millions of people. Well, that's not supernatural. Anybody can do that. A, a devil could get a script and read it online or memorize it and declare it and be a person who's not living for the Lord. So that's not a supernatural. It, it's supernatural when uh, the, uh, one is dependent upon the Lord for the manifestation, the articulation, and all of the activities associated with it that man could not do by himself. So, so often people do things that are great and nice from the vantage point of us being human. You know, if you had enough money, then yeah, you could, you could feed millions of people, thousands of people. Uh, you can grant the money to those people who are going through sickness and disease. That's not supernatural. That's a natural means. Uh, maybe you were born with that wealth, or maybe you acquired it through working in a company, but uh, a person that's not saved can do the same thing. So we need to make sure we make a distinction. He's talking about supernatural things that we get involved in, that we can do uh, in this dispensation of grace that he didn't do during his time here, but that doesn't mean he could not have done it, but he's saying because uh, we are living in a different time and there's different types of uh, other things that can be done supernatural that were not done during the time of Christ that are perhaps that are being done now supernaturally by the Holy Spirit, uh, by who, those who are believers who believe and execute, exercise the Word of God. I, I trust that's enough. Uh, the Lord Jesus also made uh, further statements uh, to make sure we have an understanding of sickness and disease. The Lord made it clear that the eradication of sin, notice this, or sickness and disease is done in the same manner. So whether you're eradicating sickness uh, or disease, or was a sin that's being re removed that is all done by the same approach. And uh, he confirmed this in Mark, the ninth chapter, verse 5, when he made the following statement. For whether it's easier, this is the Lord Jesus talking to the crowds that were gathered there, uh, looking at this person who was sick, and he's, he's moving forward to take advantage of the opportunity to bring clarity to those people who were confused about what he could and could not do. He said, for whether it is easier to say, thy sin be forgiven thee. The Lord Jesus is saying this. What to say, arise and walk. He said, what's well, easier for me to do? Because after all is said and done, it's being done by, under the auspices of the Lord. Jesus said he did nothing unless he heard it first from his Father. He did nothing aside from the Holy Spirit. And so here we see him doing signs and wonders, but it's under the auspices of the Holy Spirit, not because he was the Son of God. And we need to get that clear in our minds, that he did nothing unless it was ordained by the Father. He did nothing except the Spirit of the Lord actually is the one who controlled him and directed him into doing those supernatural feats. Uh, Mark 9 and 5. For whether it is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk. Six verse. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up thy bed, and go unto the house. So here the Lord, by the offices of the Holy Spirit, uh, which he had been filled with, uh, he's, he's doing a sign miracle to, with his declaration to the person to arise or have his sins first forgiven and to arise and take up his bed and to walk supernaturally. And he arose and departed uh, to his house. Now I want you to notice what people said when they watch. People say a lot of things, but it's just amazing that it was captured uh, in the word here. And this is the eighth verse, Mark uh, 9, chapter 8 verses. But when the multitude saw it, saw the miracle that took place, and the fact that uh, not only could he uh, confess uh, healing in the person's body, but he could declare that his sins be forgiven him, it says, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. And so, again, this gets back to what the Lord said. The works that I do shalt thou do, and greater works than these shalt thou do, because I go unto the Father. So the same kind of works we saw Jesus do during his earthly sojourn for the 33 years, especially for the years after he was uh, baptized by John in the Jordan, and then the identification of the Holy Spirit being inside of his life. And from that point forward, the latter part of uh, those uh, 33 years, he began to operate in supernatural power. The first miracle that he ever did 
uh, was in Cana of Galilee. I believe it's the fourth chapter of the book of uh, St. John. So that, uh, when he turned the water to wine. So before that time, there's nothing recorded that he did that was supernatural. So uh, the whole lifetime that he lived, he, he was uh, identifying with us as human beings, going through the issues that humans go through uh, without sinning, and then ultimately becoming the lamb for the people when he died on Calvary's cross, praise God, uh, during the crucifixion. So Job's testing, let's get back to that, or temptation, was comprehensive. We looked at quite a few of them uh, in our earlier um, presentations, uh, and complete because uh, it hit every aspect of uh, his life, including the person that was to be uh, the nearest and dearest to him, his wife. And uh, the testing uh, caused Job's wife to be uh, revealed for what she was, and uh, an ungodly woman, void of faith, Job, the second chapter, and the ninth verse. So even though a person may be with you, uh, they may be uh, an unbeliever, unbelieving, so-called believer. One may confess that they're a child of God, but the way they act, uh, they really are not really committed and devoted to the things of God. And, and that happens sometimes, you know, even with Lot. You go back to, way back to the book of Genesis. You know, uh, there was a judgment that was being dropped upon Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a city that was indulged in uh, homosexuality and a host of other things that were forbidden by God. And uh, Lot happened to be uh, the only holy man in that city that was still living a, a godly life, and he covered his family, his, uh, uh, his two daughters and his wife, and even the, the son-in-laws who were married to his uh, daughters uh, did not subscribe to his beliefs and were living the same kind of wicked lifestyle that was available to them to live, just like today. We, the, the law allows all kinds of things to take place that are not sanctioned by the Lord and that are not scripture, uh, sins that will damn you to hell. You know, there's a lot of sins I, I, I picked out one there, uh, homosexuality, but there's a whole host of others, murder, uh, incest, and uh, um, having sex outside of marriage, uh, sleeping with anybody you want to, uh, hurting folks, shooting people. I mean, you can think of a whole list of things that people do that God does not sanction, does not agree with, and as far as he's concerned, he considers it to be sin, whether the law does or not. So a number of those things I mentioned, uh, they're lawful events you can do as long as you don't hurt anybody. You know, people are being hurt, but in terms of uh, the, the criteria that's been established by the government, if you don't uh, breach any of the criteria, then uh, you're okay. They won't put you in jail. But uh, that doesn't mean that God sanctioned it. It's just that people have gotten together, decided what they wanted to make laws and what they did not, and uh, they didn't record, go examine the Word of God to see what does God say about it. They don't care about God. All they care about is what they want. And so they pass laws based upon what they desire and what they want, which has been the case of human being from the beginning of the time. Man has always wanted to pass rules and governing things that have nothing to do with God. It's what he wants and liberties that he wants, whether God says it's not something that is sanctioned by him or not. Uh, most of them are not saved, so they'll pass any laws. They won't even, many don't even recognize that it's something that is opposed to the Lord because they haven't had any relationship with him uh, for their whole life or for years, so they really don't know. They don't read their Bible. They don't go to church. And so, actually, they're, they're, I guess you can characterize them as educated heathens, most of them. You know, they got good scholarship and the things that they know about. They know nothing about the Lord. They're dead in trespasses and sins. And the only way the eyes of their understanding can be opened and enlightened is they have to embrace Jesus as Lord and begin to tread and move in a different direction than what they have before. Praise the Lord. So Job, the second chapter, the ninth verse, makes it very clear here. Um, uh, then his wife, talking about Job's wife, who was with him all those years and saw all the things that took place and saw all the benefits and the bounty God had brought to them. And you could assume that, oh, she was a godly woman. Not necessarily. Uh, it says here, then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. And so people who are haphazard, who are not really committed to the Lord, has an easy time of saying that, you know. Well, this religious thing must not be real, you know. Why don't you quit? Kick it to the curb. It must, we must have got our benefit and bounty uh, by other means. And so it's really easy to not believe the things of God. And very easily they can be swayed by what the world says, what the system says. And, uh, you know, I, I sit and I watch people who call themselves Christians. They're so sympathetic and empathetic to sin. And uh, won't tell people 
that certain things are not, uh, God does not agree with that kind of behavior. They just sit back quiet, mom, pass laws that they don't know that God doesn't sanction, but write and agree with them as though they uh, agree with that, uh, you know, to keep peace. But it's funny, on the other side, they don't care about your peace. They just want what they want. And so uh, I made it a habit myself is that, uh, you know, People may do whatever they want to do, but I think, I think we all as believers should say that I don't subscribe to what you're doing, and you may not even subscribe to what I believe in. So I don't believe in what you're involved in, so I don't subscribe to that kind of behavior. And if you agree with the kind of behavior that I believe in, then you will subscribe to it. But we live in a free country, fortunately, and so I don't have to agree with what you do, and you can't make me agree. Similarly, you may not agree with what I do and what I believe in, and uh, you can't and I can't make you follow those things. It has to be free will uh, for a person to make a choice to do either right or to do wrong. And you have that choice, especially in a place like this. And even in a place where uh, you would call it a dictator or where they have laws against any and everything, you just use discretion and you may be forced to do certain things and you're not doing it, you're doing it in a, a manner that is not actually uh, embracing it. You're just doing it to keep peace. And there's ways that people do that. You know, they just don't say anything about certain things that uh, are sanctioned by the government, which are wrong. So, uh, anyway, you have to make a choice. Tenth verse, uh, Job, the second chapter, and uh, the tenth verse. Uh, but he said to her, his wife, uh, you speak as one of foolish women. He called his wife a foolish woman. If you do that today, they're ready to divorce you. Praise the Lord. Um, and sometimes it's your discretion what we say. Uh, but you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Uh, and the word foolish is from the Hebrew word uh, Nabal. You, and later on, well, we may get to the subject of Nabal, who was a man who also demonstrated stubbornness that shouldn't be in the, uh, the hearts of individuals. Uh, but this word here, foolishness, is the word Nabal. And what it means is vile, morally wicked, or heathen. So he called his wife that. Uh, it, probably the terminology used was not as uh, direct as this, but it certainly had the implication uh, where she understood what it meant. Uh, shall we indeed accept good from God? This is, uh, these are the words of Job. And shall we not accept adversity? And so uh, here I would just simply say that uh, adversity does not come from the Lord. He may, by his permissive will, allow adversity. So Job, during his time, having not been fully enlightened in the things of God, so from his vantage point, that even though it may have come, he's going to find out later on that those things did not come from the Lord. He thought at this particular juncture in his life that those bad things that he was experiencing was something that God had sanctioned. And then later on, we're going to find him repenting because his thought process was wrong. He was blaming God for things that were being done by the devil. A lot of us today are blaming God for things that are really not done by God, uh, but it's actually being done by the devil. And sometimes it is his, his, it is his permissive will. Praise the Lord. Like the plague that's coming across the land right now. People, why would God do that? Well, if you look at it, there's a number of reasons the Lord may allow the uh, COVID-19 plague to kill so many people and cause the problem. Thing. But the one behind it is not the Lord. The person behind it is Satan. And he hasn't even given permission for that. And there's, just think about it. There's a few things that the Lord is trying to do. He's trying to bring this whole thing down to an end. I know you enjoying your family, enjoying all the nice liberties and benefits that are here, but uh, this world is coming to an end. And, uh, and the reason why it's come to an end is certain things God has required man to do. He has not done it. Uh, many don't they believe in God. And so he's going to allow certain things that are negative and terrible uh, to be experienced in this world. And then finally, he's going to bring it to an end and start a new dispensation. And so if you haven't not a scholar of the Bible and not one who reads the Bible, you may not know that. You're just enjoying your little life that you have, especially if things are going well. And when sickness and disease comes, first thing we say, or oh, wreck, you know, or a person is, uh, mind is lost or they're killed on the freeway. Where was God? Well, he's always where he's been, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, where he ever liveth to make intercession for us. If you're not living for him, you have no right to charge him with anything. If you're living for the Lord, then you can say, Lord, we don't understand, you know, wh what's happening right here. We, I ask you to heal my body. I ask you to, to assist me, to help me. And even with that, he takes his time because he's God, you know, because his development and growth is what he wants out of everything we encounter in life. And so you may not see a full manifestation immediately, but I'll say that if you hold on to the, the Lord, uh, there will be a manifestation of those things you ask. 
If you ask for a job, it might take you. We have a person at our church right now, and I'm sure it's a whole host of others too. A uh, number of years he had been waiting, and the Lord came back and answered all of uh, his problems and situations. And now it's funny how when I mean, you get on the, the right side of the challenge, you know, the Lord bless you with a job that you've been trying for for 10 iterations, and every time somebody else was taken, uh, you're trying to increase your income, and you're a believer living for God, being faithful. But then when it comes at the appointed time, that's why the Bible said, be not weary in well-doing. For in due season, you shall reap if you faint not. Notice that. In due season, you will reap if you faint not. So make sure that uh, we uh, uh, not slip you know, and fall because of the time period it takes for a manifestation of what we ask the Lord to do. And uh, the things that you're encountering, the Lord releases the enemy to do what he wants sometimes because people need a wake-up call. And the only way to wake you up is things like this. I'm sure everybody's thinking about a host of issues now uh, when we're on a shutdown inside of our house where you can't go to the bars, you can't go to the football game, baseball games and all. You're just stuck there in the house. Some of y'all listen to me right now. And I'm sure that at this time, uh, you're contemplating issues and things that you never thought about, but it's shutdown time. So you have a point to to really look at your life and look at what's happening uh, in the world. Praise the Lord. Again, the 10th verse here, uh, Job 2 and 10. Uh, the Bible says declare the whole council. If you wonder why I have to do that, well, listen, there's so many people that they're not sharing the whole gospel. Paul told me I'm supposed to share the whole gospel. So if it's something that's related to another issues that you're encountering and you don't have an understanding, my job is to bring understanding. That's why I've been called to be a preacher. Because I did it. The precept must be on precept. That's uh, in Isaiah 28 and 10 and 11. Despite what some are angry at me because I'm telling the whole truth. But I'm supposed to. So what good am I if I hold back? He said, he that uh, is a watchman on the wall, I'm a watchman on the wall. He said, the enemy coming and uh, problems and challenges coming. And uh, you do not warn the people, then their blood shall be on your hands. I don't want your blood on my hand. I'm going to tell you. The good, the bad, and the perceived ugly, so that when it, when I stand before the Lord, I won't be judged. But if I know what's wrong, and I know the enemy's coming, I know that's going to be what people are involved in is going to be to your demise. And I have the opportunity to tell you, and I don't tell you anything about it. And then you die, and you stand before the Lord. The first thing in your mind is, say, well, why didn't that preacher tell me? Why didn't you declare that? Uh, no, no, that's not going to happen with me, because I'm going to tell you all of it. And then you're going to have to make a choice as to whether you want to subscribe to that or reject it. And that's what happens with God's Word. He lays it all out, and you have to be a diligent student. So let's say you're not diligent. You don't care about all that Christian stuff. I'm not going to read it. I'm not, just because you replace it with something else, that's going to be, you're going to be charged with that. Because when you stand before the Lord, He's going to ask you the question. Why didn't you pursue what you were warned about? Why did you feel that was not important? Why did you replace it with music and, and with uh, social programs and, and comic strips and movies and everything else, except why don't you go open your Bible and read to see if what was said was so. Just like the, the noble Bereans were talked about by Apostle Paul. He wrote that in the Bible so that people can know you have a responsibility. He said they were, he, they were not like the Thessal Thessalonians. If you look at the book of Thessalonians, Paul talks about them. He said he taught and preached to them, but they wouldn't hear. They wouldn't even... Even when he made a declaration, they wouldn't go examine the Bible to see if what he was saying was true, the Bible that existed up to that time. Uh, they wouldn't spend the time to, to, to probe and to, to make sure that what they're doing was in sync with the things of God. And there's a lot of people that way today. They're lazy when it comes to the things of God, but they have all kinds of energy for everything else. And if I was the way what they're spending their times on to the time, things of Christ, uh, the things of Christ would not would be very light if you had a scale you could put it on. It would be he would be way up here, the Lord, the things of God. The things of the devil would be way down here. It's more important until it's time to die. When it's time to die, then they want to. Every single one of them wants somebody to pray for them. If and some are so stubborn they don't even want to do that. But my point is this: that uh, uh, when things come that are terrible in our lives, don't blame it on God. You know, most of us we've had opportunities, many opportunities to get it right. So now you're rushing God, bum-rushing him, trying to get things right, hoping that you get a prayer to. I found this the case even with uh, some of the celebrities and people with money, but they're no different than us. I mean, if money can't buy you a healing, money can't get you out of the challenge you're in, 
And you hear there's a possibility that a man or some man can do it. They'll go to all these foreign religions and hope that they can find a solution. If you find someone right here, believes in healing, faith healing that your people scoff at because they have no faith at all, uh, they'll even find them out. Sometimes they will uh, put on a costume. Uh, I was watching on TV a few years ago. Uh, one of his fellows that was dying of incurable disease, well known, but he had to put on a, a costume and change the way he looked and all that, but they found out he was out in the audience. He had a cancer that he wanted to be cured from, but none of the medicine and the remedies that he had used didn't work. He wanted to live. And he came there and he got healed. The Lord healed him despite his disguise and, and all the other things he was doing. He got healed of the incurable disease. And the Lord lets us know that he is a caring God. You know, he has compassion uh, that, that's boundless for everybody, whether you deserve it or not. Uh, he does it because he's good. Uh, and he's a gracious God. And so uh, the individual was, uh, was healed. Praise the Lord. He did give a testimony. And he was so grateful that somebody was around that uh, was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ and, and still believed that God, Jesus Christ, is saying yesterday, today, and forever, that he hasn't changed, that he's still a healer, that he's still a deliverer. I praise the Lord. Let's get back to the script here. Ten first, uh, Job 2 and 10. But he said to her, you speak as one of a foolish woman, and we went through that discussion. And uh, it says, And shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? Uh, adversity uh, may be permissive will that the Lord uh, will allow certain things to come. But in all that Job did, he did not sin with his lips. Um, so I'm sure that Job was shocked at, at his wife's behavior after having much as reared a family with her whom, that, whom uh, had been killed. Uh, Satan, of course, was behind the, the death. Uh, having acquired great wealth and notoriety in his country from the hand of God and seeing that his wife did not recognize the source of their blessings. I mean, that could really hurt a person. A person been with you all these years. The kids were grown, the ones that were killed. So, so we figured at least 20-some years or more, maybe 30 years, that he'd been with this woman and she didn't understand, didn't comprehend what he thought she had that God is the reason why we've been blessed, not because of us, praise the Lord. Her words indicated she did not believe uh, that the source of their blessings had come from God. She apparently thought uh, they were from their own human ingenuity, praise the Lord. Even the great apostle Paul was deceived by his peers in ministries that he believed were really committed to God, uh, for he, he lamented uh, what had happened to him, saying this about one of his fallen brothers, Demas, the following in 2 Timothy 4 and 10. So I'm just showing you here, it still happens even in our day, not just in the day of Job, that even as, as Christians and believers, uh, people who are supposed to be associated with you, it could be a minister in the word, can fall by the wayside, can backslide and go back living for the devil. This is what he said in 2 Timothy 4 and 10. For Demas has forsaken me after all those years being a team member with the Apostle Paul, he forsook him. And of course, those who live godly shall per suffer persecution. So if you're a child of God, you're going to run to all kinds of people that were with you for a while and then they're gone. Um, having loved this present world, he said he loved the present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Uh, and the next believer here, he didn't say whether these were had left the Lord. They just, for whatever reason, they weren't ready to move on with uh, with uh, uh, declaring the word of God at this time. It doesn't mean they backslid. They just need to go get their act together. But he was real clear about Demas. Uh, um, for Thessalonica, Christian went to De Thessalonica. Uh, for Galatia, Titus, uh, for Galatia, excuse me, Christian for uh, Galatia and uh, Titus for Dalmatia. So they'd gone to different places. They had dispersed from the Apostle Paul. And sometimes it's not a sin to disperse. Uh, but uh, the ones who was into sin was Demas. That's the only one. So it's clear that Demas had backslidden and was in danger of eternal perdition because the scripture says, you got to listen. It's not what man says. It's what the scripture say. All oh, he did all these great works and things. He couldn't possibly go into hell. Well, 1 John 2 and 15, verses 15 to 16 says the following. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So you can't love the world. I mean, you can like the world we're in to some degree, but we can't love it. You know, put our uh, total uh, soul in the things we're doing. 
uh, to the absence of the Lord. I'd say that way. The Bible says you shall not have any other gods before you. So now if you made the things of this world your God, I mean, that's the thing that drives you and that you're focused on all the time. All these late hours you're working is on some kind of career that you have to the absence of having any time for the Lord, then the, that becomes your God. You love them more. You expend more time and effort with those other things than you do with the things of God. You love the things, the orderly arrangement and man's way of doing things. That's what that term means. The word cosmos or the world is the word cosmos in the Greek. And it means man's orderly way and arrangement of doing things. And so you're caught up in how man would do things. You're not caught up in how, nor do you care how God does things. You don't even think about him when you're making your decisions. You don't ask him for directions and things of that nature because you're not living for him. Praise the Lord. So do not love the world nor the things in the world. Or any, she says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So regardless of what you say, regardless of how many good deeds you did, uh, you don't love the Lord. So there's usually there's always an alternative, the ulterior motive that people have in their heart when they uh, are spending their money to do a lot of things. It's not God driving them to do things. It's because they have some other return they're going to receive that's outside uh, the things of God that they're going to get benefit from. 16 verse, First John 2 and 16. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, so Paul's telling us, the lust of the eyes is the flesh, and that things that what we see that uh, excites us, and the pride of life, you know, oh man, look at me, I'm on top of the hill. Uh, I'm the richest person in the world. Now, some rich people are not like that. I mean, you, you can be rich and be a blessing to people, and you do it just because out of the goodness of your heart. And uh, you don't uh, want any return. Some people do it secretly so nobody knows about it. You definitely know that they're not doing it for other people to know about because they, they make sure that the distribution of the money is not known where the source is. And others may just do it because they don't care, which is okay. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, it's the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it's of the world. So these attributes here are the ones that caused uh, Adam and Eve to fall in the Garden of Eden. But I won't get into that today. The Lord understands our weaknesses as human beings. Therefore, he admonished us with these words in Galatians 6 and 9. He says, And let us not grow weary in well-doing. Here it is. For in due season we shall reap if we faint or do not lose heart. King James says, if we faint not. Here in the New King James it says, if we do not lose heart. So, there's a continuing the things of God. And at the appointed time, there will be in due season. Uh, if you're trusting the Lord for it, there will be a manifestation of those things that you desire. And so... Uh, uh, the word is clear. If you preserve all of, in the, if you persevere in the things of God, despite the challenges, he has a season of blessing prepared for you, especially if you're a child of God. Anticipate it, believe in it, and you will walk in it. I was talking about the fellow who, and a host of others who are doing the things of God, and uh, now they have mighty testimony about how God brought them through all of the challenges and the problems. A, uh, you know, I, I talk about parasmos, temptation. Remember that? It is an experience of good through the Word of God, experimentation of good, and then an experience, notice, experimentation of good, of the Word of God and the promises of God, and an experience of evil. And having gone through being picked over, uh, somebody that they bring into the corporation, uh, it might be someone uh, that's uh, part of that person's family, uh, grandson or granddaughter, and they're not equipped at all to do the job. Or maybe a friend, uh, or be somebody of another race that uh, they don't like you because of your race. And they keep picking people. And they may let you do it 10, ten iterations. You're training people uh, in a job that you knew you know, intimately. They know you know that. But they just keep taking advantage of you over and over again. And the question is, Lord, why? Well, because he's trying to build some patience uh, in you as a child of God. And it's for you to have a mighty testimony at the appointed time. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 3 and 20. Uh, begins uh, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So the point is uh, we shouldn't forget the fact that the Lord is watching us as children of God and we need to trust him when we uh, are going through these situations that are not pleasant. You know, just like as the case with Job. You know, his wife had really turned her back on her ready to move and do something differently. But Job maintained his confidence in the Lord. Theologians believe that Job's trial, the testing, lasted uh, less than a year. Prior to his trials, uh, he had lived 70 years. But after this, 
the trials that he went through, uh, and we're going to be bringing it to conclusion shortly, uh, talk about that. He lived 140 years, so just understand that. At 70, he went through all kinds of hail and high water, but the Lord allowed him to live till he was 140 years, indicating God doubled his life, praise God, because he had endured his season of testing. So the Lord will double your life, praise God, maybe not in longevity and age, but it'll be so much better on the other side of the challenge that you're going through. The implication is God is faithful. Ephesians 3 and 20, now to him that's able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So we have to be committed to the Lord. and We allow his power, the Holy Spirit. Uh, we talked about Holy Ghost power. Uh, you say you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Uh, praise the Lord. When that takes place, then the Lord is making it clear that uh, he will exceed the expectations that we have. So after his wife's ultimatum to uh, Job uh, to curse God and to die, Job went into a state of depression, and his friends came to comfort him. That's a normal response, isn't it? So Job is a type of the child of God. And listen, the name Job is from a Hebrew word, which is pronounced Eobi, Eobi. And what it means is hated, persecuted. So Job's name means one who is hated and persecuted. I didn't say it at the beginning, but I'm telling you now. Uh, despite all the riches and wealth that he had amassed, he was hated, praise the Lord. Uh, another uh, word, that word hate there means to revile, loathe, detest, despise. Despite the fact that he was highly recognized in the, in the area that he was in, um, one of the most honorable men in the, the East, uh, this is how people felt and looked at him. The word persecute means to press, to harass, to bully, to treat badly, and to discriminate against. So the Apostle Paul confirms the hate and the persecution believers would experience in uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 12. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, referring to believers, shall suffer persecution. So when you make up your mind to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will become a target of hate and disdain to Satan and his cohorts, which might even be somebody kin to you. Uh, unknowingly and sometimes even knowingly. Uh, unfortunately, many people, even those close to you, may become willing vessels through which Satan may exercise his wrath against you. I mean, why wouldn't he use that? Persons closest to you uh, give you a hard time and uh, just make life miserable for you because they become an unwitting pawn of Satan. See, if you're not being used by the Lord, then you are, whether you know it or not, being used by Satan. So, um, just think about that. If you're not living for the Lord and not being used by him, you're being used by the devil. Just stop and see some of the things you're doing, and I think you agree with me. Praise the Lord. So after the floods of adversity, represented by the loss of enormous wealth, the murder of his servants, the death of all his children, and the harsh suggestions of his wife, Job became overwhelmed, praise the Lord, and with emotion. And he said the following, um, Job 3 and 3. Let the day perish wherein I was born. He, he hated the idea he was ever born. And the night in which it was said, there is a male child conceived, uh, Job uh, 3 and 25 to 26, for the things which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. So here is Job talking about it. 26 verse, uh, I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble. He's lamenting about all the trouble and stuff he'd run into, and he thought he was in a safe place. He was in a safe place. It's just that uh, he didn't have an understanding that uh, there are t challenges and tests that can come, parasmos, come to the life of every one of us, even as believers. We just have to make sure that we start charging God because things are not going the way we'd like. A better rendering of this last verse that I just read uh, is given by the Moffat translation when it says, I get no peace, I get no rest. I get no ease, uh, only attacks of agony. See, he's talking about what's happening to him. Um, I, his faith may be waning a little bit here because he should have kept it to himself. Although Job expressed the sincere emotions he was feeling in his heart, we who are believers today should deal differently than Job did praise, because of the enlightenment of the indwelling. He didn't have it during his day, indwelling Holy Spirit and the Word of God. We have no excuse for it acting like Job did, he, he did not have all the canon of scripture things that we have, which had not been fully revealed 
to Job during his dispensation. So this book was written way back during the time of uh, uh, Moses, sometime around Moses, uh, his date. And so he didn't have all the scriptures and things, not even the law to look at, to govern his life. The Apostle Paul addressed this. I think this is going to be our last few verses here. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses 6 through 7. says, be careful, anxious for nothing, but in everything, uh, by prayer and supplication, definite request, with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. Philippians 4 and 7. Uh, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. See, this scripture wasn't written during the time of Job, but it's written for us. So we have ample information uh, available to us and tools to keep us from responding uh, as Job responded his day because he didn't have all his assists. Uh, just like believers today, Job seemed to have forgotten that he was to be a target of hate and persecution. We found out what his name is, Iobi. Uh, even when we understand these reasons for attacks in our lives, the greatest obstacle to m maintaining our faith uh, is in the midst of trouble is fear. Fear by its very nature paints a picture of a future filled with alarm, anxiety, dread, and terror. Fear is a hypnotic tranquilizer, a dart that the devil shoots at us to immobilize and make us docile, submissive, and compliant to his whims. It is a nightmare which amplifies negative possibilities uh, and makes them appear real. Through the avenue of fear, Satan, listen to this, communicates the desires for you. A life of deprivation, divorce, unemployment, incurable disease, incarceration, loneliness, and despair. If you allow yourselves to hear Satan's lies continually, you will begin to believe them. This is the reason Jesus cautioned us, saying the following, Mark 4, chapter and 24th verse, Take heed what you hear. You need to be careful about what you're listening to. Jesus made it clear, equally important is careful how you hear. So what you hear, how you hear, Luke the 8th chapter and 18th verse. Take heed, therefore, how you hear. So we'll talk about this more in detail the next time, but uh, be careful what you're listening to. Praise God. Any and everything needs to be guarded and checked out to make sure it's not contrary to what God's saying in his word. So you do need to read your Bible, meditate on the word day and night, observe to do all that's written therein. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. God bless you. Go with God. This is Will Nutt. Till the next time. Hello. Thank you for listening to this resource. If you would like to receive our audio DVD catalog or desire more information about our ministry, you may write to us at P.O. Box 612-822, San Jose, California, 95161-2822. Or you may request information via our website at www sjwofcc.org We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.